this is GPT-3. So I'm gonna stop with GPT-3, the language modeling part of the course or the NLP part of the course. I'm gonna stop with GPT-3, but there are other improvements upon GPT-3. There is a paper by Google recently, et cetera, but uh, you get the idea of how things are working. I think you have a solid background now that you can start reading the papers on your own. So we have this, uh, we have this traditional fine tuning, which is bird type models. You do fine tuning, you do pre-training fine tuning, pre-training fine tuning on the target task. For the fine tuning part, you see an example, let's say you want to translate, that's your downstream task, and you already pre-trained your language model. Now you want to fine tune it. This is not what you're gonna do for GPT-3, by the way. An example comes in, you do some gradient updates, you do your stochastic gradient descent. Another example is gonna come in, stochastic gradient descent, and then you update your gradients until in the end, you can do your prediction. Somebody gives you cheese and then your model can translate. This is fine tuning. And you can think of it as if you are doing a soft conditioning on your data. If data comes in, you update your gradients. This could be soft conditioning, okay? The idea of GPT-2 was that you can actually do hard conditioning. What do I mean? You can actually write down what you want from the model. You want to translate English to French. So you write it down, you describe your task, you give it an example or a prompt, and then you condition on this. You condition on translate English to French and cheese and then, so you condition on your task description and your prompt, and then you predict a couple of next words until you see the stop or the end of the sentence. This is zero shot learning. You can show it a couple of examples, like here you are showing it C utter, and the corresponding translation, you can show it an example in addition to task description and prompt and do a hard conditioning on this. So you condition and you predict the next words. You can have multiple other examples. Rather than having one, you can have multiple other examples and then you can predict the next words. So to me, this is stronger in terms of conditioning. That's why I'm calling it hard conditioning. You're conditioning on what you want to do you're coming up with your posterior distribution and you're, you keep updating your prior as data comes in, as examples comes in. Here it is soft conditioning. A data comes in and you update your parameters. Another data comes in, you update your parameters. You are not conditioning on your data in a hard manner. So that's the difference and the similarity between these two frameworks. You will still have that outer loop, which is pre-training, and that one, you're going to do a stochastic gradient descent. For the inner loop, you are not going to do fine tuning. You're going to do in-context learning. You show it a couple of examples, the task description, the prompt, and then it has to do, for instance, here it is, the task is 5 plus 8 is 13, 7 plus 2 is 9. You're describing your task that way, and then you're going to show it, I don't know, 10, I don't know, 5 plus 2 is what? Equals, and then the algorithm needs to tell tell you the answer. This could be fixing the uh, dictation or you can translate. Thanks, merci, etc. The idea of this paper is that you can actually scale this. If you have 1.3 billion parameters, this was GPT-2, and we saw that this wasn't beating the state of the art. It was impressive that it was actually doing something, but it wasn't beating the state of the art. The idea of this paper is that what if you scale things, you give it a lot of data and you throw at it a lot of compute and a lot of parameters. What's gonna happen? Are you gonna start uh, seeing close to the state of the art results? So this one is not scaling that well, but then as you go to 13 billion parameters and you keep showing it more examples, okay? This axis is the number of examples. And if you go to 175 billion parameters, and here you are going from zero shot framework to one shot framework, or you keep showing it more examples, few shot. And then you're gonna see much better accuracy and then your model starts to scale. What is the data that they use? It's a common crawl data set and they're gonna filter it. There is the web text data set. There are two internet-based books, corpora, 
and there is the English language Wikipedia. So for pre-training, they have a very large corpus, basically the entire internet. For fine-tuning, there is no fine-tuning. It's just going to be in-context learning. So you condition. It's hard conditioning. You can use this model to solve different tasks, and you can see the applications. The applications are a lot. One of the applications is generating text. So you give it a paragraph, and then it's going to keep imagining uh, imaginary people uh, and then coming up with a story of its own. And sometimes this story is really hard for a human to understand. Is it real or is it fake? So you have to think a little bit more uh, to understand whether it's a fake or it's a real text. It's not that obvious that it's coming from a machine. But one of you mentioned, why are you going to 107 billion parameters? Or you were asking about GPT-2 two sessions ago. Why do you need to have a model that is that big? Can't you solve those problems? with less parameters? The answer is yes. You can solve those problems with less parameters, but why are we going that route? Because we are now moving towards general AI. Okay, So far, we were trying to solve a, a sentiment analysis task, but now we want to have something that is capable of solving multiple different tasks, not only a classification task, not only a translation task, but all of them. You give it a description and you want it to solve that task. You show it a couple of examples and you want it to, show, to solve that problem without changing your model. So I was explaining about that story that this uh, language model, GPT-3, is able to create. But then sometimes you're going to see some discrepancies in the story. And the reason for that, some people in the literature are claiming, is that uh, this model has only seen language. It hasn't seen when, it, let's say it is talking about an airplane. It has never seen an airplane. Let's, let's say it's talking about a chair. It has never seen a chair or an image of a chair. And maybe that is causing this problem, these uh, inconsistencies in the story. And that's why today we are going to start with multimodal uh, learning. Not only you learn from languages, but you also learn from images. At the same time, you learn about speech. Let's say you want to design a robot and you want to talk to your robot. You're going to say, pick this up and put it on that table. Here, what is this? Unless that robot is seeing that you're pointing at something, then it's going to know what this refers to. So language alone is not enough. It needs to be able to combine its vision and speech and text and language and human language to be able to do the type of tasks that you want it to do. Okay, any questions about GPT? So in this inner loop here for these columns, this is that few shot scenario. So yes, exactly. Like, okay, and so is there a, a fixed number of shots or is it like a random, a random number of shots? Actually, there is a diminishing return to the number of shots that you're showing it. You can see it in this figure. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, After okay. a while, this is the number of shots that you're doing. One shot, two shot, three shot, four shots, etc. Okay, I see. 10 examples, etc. And then after you do that, you update the gradient after each column. No, there is no gradient at all. There is no gradient update. Within the column, but after after you go through one few shot. No, there is no there is no fine tuning at all. There is no fine tuning at all. The outer loop is you pre-train, you fix your parameters forever, you don't update them anymore, and then you keep conditioning on new examples. There is no fine tuning, it is saying here, not used for GPT-3, no fine tuning, and no, so this, no gradient update. And this original pre-training is just some of the standard, like what we saw in GPT-2 or BERT or something? Yeah, so this is a very simple model. It's a decoder part of a transformer. Predict the next word. Okay. Or so this, predict the next subword. So that just all only relies for your downstream task. It only relies on having just multiple shots improving the context. Actually, it's going to do very good on some of these tasks for zero shot and one shot. We saw it. We saw GPT-2 was doing zero shot and one shot. Mm -hmm. Okay. But the thing to know is that the question that you're asking is very fundamental. There is no gradient update when you do in-context learning. You are just conditioning on the context. So this is your context. 
given the context, predict the next word. And then what you're gonna do here is gonna say five plus one, and it's gonna give you the answer. So this is really impressive. There is no fine tuning. There is no gradient update. It is one model that is solving multiple different problems. And if you think about it, you are getting closer to how human solve a problem. You give them the context. If I show you these examples, you're gonna know how to solve the next task. If I show you these examples, you're gonna understand the task and then solve it. Okay, you're learning from very few examples. Okay, any yeah, other that questions? Makes, that makes sense, thanks. Uh, yeah, I had a question actually. Yes. Um, so I know the data set that they are training on is, is quite massive. So in regards to the zero shot and one shot, how do they actually know that it's zero shot and they haven't seen those turning, um, I guess, worlds or whatever they're turning on in the data set because it's so large? Yes, so you're right. There could be some data contamination. Maybe the model has seen these sorts of arithmetic before or the type of downstream task because your corpus is very large. And if you read this paper, it's a 75 page paper. Okay, and they try to control for the contamination and study it. I would say if you read the paper, the most frequently used in that paper is contamination. Yes, you're right. There could be data contamination. Does that answer your question? Yeah, definitely. And, and here is where the data matters. For instance, the model that comes out of GPT-3 could be sexist. It could be racist. It could have all sorts of biases because the text on the internet is crazy. There is no filter on it. Okay. Any other questions? In like a, a, a use case, if I was going to use GPT to say like solve a math problem, like on the mm -hmm. left here, would I need to have on hand my set of few shot examples? Yes. In addition so to you, my like target? Yes. So you need to describe the task for it. So this part is the small data that you have at hand. And then the rest of it is just conditioning. Okay. This is going to be the input to GPT-3. And then the output is going to be the answer to your problem. No training. So the other argument against uh, these types of models, the massive size models, is that uh, do, you really, do you really need it to be that big? And an answer to that is that this is just a small fraction of a human brain. So this is a tiny fraction. It's uh, orders of magnitude smaller. Okay. So what do you mean? The brain has 86 billion neurons. So it's actually double the amount of neurons that a human brain does has. Uh, the number of neurons is different from the number of connections. Okay, this is the number of connections. These are the parameters. Okay. And that could, uh, if you count the number of neurons, and then uh, you want to have pairs of connections between them, this is a combinatorially huge size in terms of your parameters. Okay? So this is in terms of parameters, connections. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it makes sense because human... Uh... Nuance is 86, but the connection is like trillions and trillions. Yeah. Okay. So I said there are some drawbacks to these big language models. And the drawback, at least to me, is that these models have not seen what they are talking about is not grounded in terms of they have never seen a chair before. They have never seen a table before. They have heard about it in human language, but they have never seen it. So that's why we want to go to multimodal now 